I have titled this talk, cleverly enough, Transformation Implementation. Here we go, points for rhyming. And so all week we have been unpacking the stories of Peter, Simon Peter. And tonight what I want to do is I want to track three of those stories specifically, and out of those stories I want to pull for you three steps for you to take away with you. And these are three steps to ensure transformation in your life. Now I have chosen three readers throughout the room tonight to read things, and as they read, I would ask that you really pay attention, because I think it's really important for us to dig deep into God's Word tonight, because I believe that when we dig deep into God's Word, God's Word digs deep into us. Yeah. That would have been the place to respond, because I'm not a preacher, but I know that was good, okay? <laughs> So I'm going to say it one more time to give you a little practice. The deeper we dig into God's word, the deeper God's word will dig into us. Amen? Let's go. Let's go now. We're about to get it. Alyssa, would you please stand and read? Please pay attention. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And once they left their necks and they followed him. In the early 1980s, Steve Jobs was working at Apple, and he was heading a project called Lisa. And Lisa at the time was supposed to be the most revolutionary, game-changing computer ever to hit the industry. And Steve Jobs, for those of you who don't know, was a very passionate person, and he was an unending perfectionist. And that's what made him so good at what he did. But it was also what made him oftentimes rude and extremely belligerent with his employees. And in this case, it's what ended up getting Steve fired from being the project head of Lisa. You see, even though Steve was the founder of Apple, the CEO and the board, they decided that his sort of controversial personality uh, was too hard to deal with and that it put such a high profile project in jeopardy. So what they did was they moved Steve to a different project one that was much lower profile, one that no one would ever really hear of, and if it failed, no one would really care. The company had no stake in it because it was doomed to fail. That project was called the Macintosh, which is now called the Mac. And as soon as Steve got moved onto the Mac team, he started recruiting people. So watch this. Hey, Steve. Hold this for a second. Yeah. Thanks. What, what's going on? What are you doing? Steve, you're on the Macintosh team now. What? What's a Macintosh? Andy Hertzfeld, are you good? I only want good people working on Macintosh, and I'm not sure if you're good enough. <laughs> Excuse me? Bill Atkinson says that you're good. I guess. I think I'm pretty good. Are you creative? I, I, I think so. Welcome to the Macintosh team. So you see, Steve's call to his employees was really, really simple. It was just, come with me, you're on the Mac team now. And in a very similar way, Jesus' call to Peter was just as simple. It was just three words. He said, come, follow me. And you see, Steve's employees, they had no idea what they were getting themselves into. They had no idea that they were about to join a team that was going to build a product that was going to revolutionize not only the computer industry, but the music industry, the communication industry, and even the internet as we know it. And in a very similar way, Peter didn't know what he was getting himself into when he followed this carpenter turned into a rabbi. He didn't know that he was following the man who was going to start the most influential movement that the world has ever known. You see, all the employees heard was, unplug your computer, you're on the Mac team. And all Peter heard was, drop your nets, come, follow me. A little side note, I think it's really interesting that even though they were going fishing, Jesus made it very clear, he said, I will make you fishers of men, we're still going fishing, yet they leave their nets behind. 
And I think if I'm going fishing, I need to bring my net because how am I supposed to catch anything? But then I realized it's because when you go fishing for fish, you're looking to catch things. But when you go fishing for people with Jesus, you're looking to set them free. You see it? You see, Jesus is called to each and every one of us. And I'm not saying each and every one of us has sort of this, you know, esoteric, like, ooh, each and every one of us, you know, Zen thing. I'm saying literally each and every one of us is so simple. It's just come, follow me. And if you ask any Christian, they will probably be able to point out an exact time or an exact place where they first heard and felt that call from Jesus. Many of you know my story. I first felt the call from Jesus at this very camp. I was 13 years old. I was lanky. I had braces. I knew nothing about theater and I knew nothing about God. I don't know why my mom sent me here. But I'm so glad she did because Thursday night of that camp, a guy stood up here. His name is Ronnie Follett. And I sat right back there on that pool table. And I remember that Ronnie talked about a perfect God and how a perfect God wanted to relate with his people. But you see, his people, which included me, had a problem. You see, our sin and our sinfulness separated us from this perfect God. And that his people, me, we deserved punishment for that sin. But you see, this perfect God didn't want to punish us because he loved us so much. So what he decided to do was send his only son to die on a cross and take the punishment for us. And that washes me clean. And when I sat back there and I, that, I heard that for the, really for the first time, I remember I just had this feeling in the pit of my stomach. and I didn't know what it was. Some of you know what that is like. And all of a sudden, I just started bawling my eyes out. And it wasn't like a pretty cry. It was like, Tears, snot, mascara. I wasn't even wearing makeup. <laughs> like, I wasn't even wearing makeup, and there was mascara running. And I remember I was just like, after Ronnie was done talking, I'm like, I just need to pray with Ronnie. Where is he? And I found him. He was like over in the corner back there. And I went up to him, and he was already praying by himself. So I was like, oh, I got to be subtle about this. So I got to whisper but because of the snot. It just came out like, Ronnie. <laughs> and he sat me down next to him, and he's like, He's like, what can I pray for you for, man? And these were my exact words. I'm not kidding you. I said, I don't know. I just have so many feelings. <laughs> it's true. And like, little did I know at the time, that's just called puberty. But like, <laughs> but I remember, and I was sitting there, and he, he was about to start praying for me. I'm like, who am I kidding? He doesn't even know my name. He doesn't even remember my name. And so many of you have had that moment where you pray with a counselor and you're like, do they even know my name? And if you want to pray with a counselor tonight, just like as soon as you walk up to them, just remind them of your name. I don't care if I've known you since you were eight years old. Just remind us so it's not awkward. The, you know, the emotions of the night get in the way sometimes. But I remember I went up to him like, he doesn't know my name. And it's right before he started praying, I'm not even kidding you. This is what happened. He goes, remind me of your name, buddy. And I was like, oh gosh, here we go. And I go like this. Done. <laughs> and he goes like this, not even joking. He bows his head and goes, Lord, I want to pray for Don. <laughs> and so when the prayer was over, I was like, I need to get out of here. So I went out, and many of you know, I went out to that bench that's outside of the chapel. And it was there that I had like my first rational thought in what felt like hours. And I remembered thinking this. I've always wanted God in my life. I just never knew that he wanted me to. You know? And that's true, and someone needs to hear that tonight. Someone who wants God in their life and has always wanted God in their life, and maybe you didn't know it was God that you wanted. Maybe you just thought you wanted a friend. Maybe you just thought you wanted a father. Maybe you just thought you wanted a counselor. Maybe you just thought you wanted someone to lead you through life. But guess what? God fills those roles, every single one of them, perfectly. And what he wants to tell you tonight is that he wants you too. That's no joke. And I remember that that feeling in the pit of my stomach, I remember and I realized that was God calling me. And if you have felt that this week, or if you've felt that in the past, I'm here to tell you right now, that's God calling you and saying, come, follow me. Because we worship a God who is in the business of calling people. You see, God has been calling people since the beginning of time. 
God called Abraham to build a family. God called Noah to build an ark. He called Jacob to build a well, Nehemiah to build a wall, and Jesus to build a way. God called David into the valley. He called Moses onto the mountain. God called Esther to speak up, Job to shut up, Ruth to stick around, and Gideon to stick it to him. God called Joshua to take a walk, Jonah to give a talk, Solomon to be wise, and Lazarus to rise. God called Elijah in a whisper. He called Elisha to dig ditches. He called Daniel to be the best. He called his disciples to love the worst. He called the prophets to speak out, and he called the church to invite in. You see, there is literally no major character in the biblical narrative who was not called by God to something greater than themselves. And we worship a God who still is calling people today. But here's the thing, y'all. Here's the thing. That's all well and great. That's all well and great. But it's no good if we are not in the business of answering. You see, and so often we are not in the business of answering because we believe this lie that I need to clean up my act first. I need to learn more about God before I start following him. I need to really understand who Jesus is. I need to get all my questions answered. I need to become a Christian before I become a Christian. But here's the thing about the call of Jesus. The call of Jesus does not say change and then come follow me. The call of Jesus says come follow me and you will change. You see... You see, Jesus doesn't call us because we're good. He calls us because he's good. You know what I'm saying? And so, the first step to transformation in your life is answer the call. You don't have to clap for that. We're about to move on. I really, I'm really bad at transitions, so we just kind of like, speaking of the next story, Allison. <laughs> that was beautiful, right? Stop! I want to read you guys something. 20 verses earlier. 20 verses. You can stay standing. Stay standing. You look gorgeous in that white dress. Here we go. Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. You see, Peter started following not knowing where he was going to go. But in this passage, Jesus makes it very clear where they're going. They're going to death. This is ending not pretty. It's ending at a cross. And Peter's response is, yep, I get it. Let's go. Let's die. Please start again from the beginning. Stop! At a distance. Peter, how are you going to die with the guy when you're following him at a distance? At a distance doesn't sound like someone who's ready to die with Jesus. How quickly things can change in just 20 verses. Go on. See, I think there's two important things to notice in this story. The first thing is Peter's, like I mentioned before, Peter's physical proximity or closeness to Jesus. You see, he already starts at a distance, which means he's already at a disadvantage. But then after his first denial, even though he's in the same courtyard, we know, we know from the passage that Jesus was tried in the courtyard, so at least he's only at a distance in the courtyard. But after the first denial, it says in verse 71, he moves out to the gateway. So now he's not even in the courtyard anymore. 
And then later on, after the final betrayal, after the final denial, it says he goes outside completely and weeps bitterly. You see, in just 20 verses, Peter has gone from sitting next to Jesus at the dinner table to following him at a distance in the courtyard to standing at the gate of that courtyard to being completely outside of that courtyard altogether. And the second thing I want you to notice is the language Peter uses. You see, with each denial... Peter's language becomes more angry and more lethal. He starts with a simple denial. I don't know the man. Then he turns it into an oath. He's saying, I swear to you, I don't know the man. And then he, the third time, he calls down curses and he swears, I don't know him. You see, sin in our lives, it brings about isolation. Sin brings about shame, and shame leads us to sort of isolate ourselves. When we're ashamed of something, what, is, what, is, what do we want to do? We just want to go to our room, put our face in a pillow, and forget about the rest of the world. And when we isolate ourselves from God, what we start to do is we start to move away from acting and speaking in His image. And as we move away from acting and speaking in His image, we sort of become angry with ourselves. And the more angry we become, the more we sin, so then more shame, so further isolation, and it's this downward spiral that maybe someone in this room, me, and maybe you, has felt, and then the rooster crows. And you see, the moment the rooster crows is significant, because listen to this, the moment the rooster crows is the moment we're confronted with our sin and shame. The moment the rooster crows is the moment where we're like, man, I really shouldn't have lied to my parents about that thing. It's that moment where you're like, oh, those... Those careless words that I said in that argument with that friend, it really did hurt them. Shouldn't have said that. It's that moment where you're like, I shouldn't have gone on those websites. I said I, never, I would never do that again. It's that moment where you're like, I can't believe I had another drunken hookup with that guy or that girl. I said I wouldn't do that. When I made the decision to become a Christian, I said I wouldn't do that anymore. And then the rooster crows and reminds us that we did. You see, the moment the rooster crows is the moment that reminds us that we are not the perfect, strong, amazing Christian that maybe we thought we were once. It's the moment where we realize we weren't really following God. We were just inviting God to follow us and hoping that Jesus would be our good luck charm. It's the moment where we realize that our choices have isolated us from God. That's what the rooster crowing stands for, for a Christian. But, to literally everyone else in the world, specifically those in the Midwest, the rooster crowing stands for something else. And I'll give you a little hint. The very next verse, after it says the rooster crowed and Peter went outside and wept bitterly, is Matthew 27, 1, and it says early in the morning. What does the rooster, what does a rooster crowing stand for? It means it's the start of a new day. You see, the rooster crowing means that night is over and morning is coming. It means that darkness is on its way out and light is on its way in. You see, it means there's a new beginning. It means there's a fresh start. And it means that the sun is about to rise. And follow me here because I'm about to blow your minds with this. You see, what Peter didn't know was that the teacher that he had just betrayed, that teacher was also a son. And what Pilate didn't know was that the man that he had just sentenced, that man was also a son. And what the soldiers didn't know was that the, the prisoner that they had just beaten, that prisoner was also a son. And what the Pharisees didn't know was that the carpenter that they had just crucified, that carpenter was also a son. Okay, okay you following me? And even though he was betrayed, even though that son was sentenced, even though that son was beaten, and even though that son was killed, when the rooster crowed, it was a reminder that that son was going to rise three days later and bring love and redemption to the world forever. That is something someone needs to hear tonight. You see, maybe, maybe this week or right now or last night, the rooster is crowing in your life. And you're being reminded of how you have betrayed God in the last year. Or you're being reminded of your sin. Or you're being reminded of your shame. Or you're being reminded of darkness or addictions or whatever it is. And if that's you, I'm here to tell you tonight that the rooster crowing in your life is not a reminder that you are broken, sinful, and far from God. The rooster crowing in your life is a reminder that even though you have sin and even though you are broken and even though you may be far from God, it ain't over. 
you see, it means it is not over. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's not finished with me yet. Turn to your neighbor, tell him. And then say, he's not finished with you yet. He's not. God's not finished with you yet. If you're still breathing, he's not finished with you. And you see, when the rooster crows in your life and you're confronted with that sin and you feel that sorrow, that's a good thing. Because 2 Corinthians 7.10 says this, it says, Godly sorrow brings about repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. You know, sorrow means that salvation is just around the corner. That's what that means. And when you're confronted with your sin and you feel so dirty and so worthless, listen to this. Listen to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You see, we have to learn to love the rooster because the rooster foreshadows resurrection. And resurrection means redemption is coming. That's what I'm talking about. And you see, some of you here need a fresh resurrection of Christ in your life tonight. And I believe you're going to get it. But we got to move on to our third step. So step one, answer the call. Step two is learn to love the rooster. So everybody just say it. Learn to love the rooster. Yeah. Emil. So this story is our final one, and it's our final step, and it begins after a meal. Does anyone know what they were eating? Fish. Because Peter and his friends were fishing, and they had caught nothing. And Andrew touched on this this morning. Isn't it interesting that after the rooster crows in our life, and after we're confronted with our sin and brokenness, the temptation is to just go back to the person we were before. Because you know what? That Christian thing didn't really work out for me. I'm not good enough to do that, so I'm just going to go back to what I was doing before. That's the temptation, yeah? It is for me. Maybe not for anybody else. But you see, what Peter discovers is something that we all will discover. Is that when we go back to our old way, it will no longer fulfill us. You see, Peter caught nothing. And even if Peter's nets were full, it wouldn't have mattered because his heart would still be empty. You see, because once you have an encounter with Jesus, you're never the same again. You see, once you have an encounter with Jesus, you're never the same again. And what used to fulfill you isn't going to fulfill you anymore because now he fulfills you and calls you to fulfill the potential he filled you with. You know what I'm saying? And so after the meal... It's time for Peter and Jesus to have this conversation. And they've been sort of awkwardly avoiding one another at this fish fry, like not going up for seconds at the same time and whatnot. Um, But now it's time for Peter to face the music. I want to tell you one about, about one of my favorite movies growing up. And it's called Remember the Titans. Come on! And Remember the Titans, for those of you who don't know, it tells the story of the 1971 T.C. Williams High School football team. And in 1971, it was the first high school to allow black and white players to play on the same team. And there's a character called Petey Jones, and Petey Jones is the running back. He's a running back at the beginning of the season, but he discovers he can't really hold on to the football. He fumbles a lot. For those of you who follow football, you know, a fumble is a bad thing. So they move Petey to defense, and that's when he becomes a star. He's a stud on defense. But halfway through the season, Titans are in a tough game, they're losing, and Petey takes off his helmet, quits on his team, and sits himself on the bench. And he's replaced by the less talented but very handsome Allen, who is played by the most boyish-looking Ryan Gosling you've ever seen. (laughs) And so, fast forward to the end of the season, the Titans are in the championship game. 
They're going into the second half. They're losing. And Petey is still on the bench. Petey's number 40. Listen up. This is our time now. Second half is our time. We're going to make some changes on defense. They're spreading us out too far. We're going to put Sunshine, Allen, Glasgow, Davis. You're going to play both ways. Rest of the game. I don't want a receiver to get across that line of scrimmage. Coach Yost will tell you where you're playing, all right? Let's go. It's our time. Everybody in. Our time. Our time. Our time. Titans on three. One, two, three. Titans! Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Choose. We're going 52 miles. Oh, I know that's all you need to know. All right, we're going zone, Alan. Sir, I can play with Roosevelt, but I cannot play with these guys. No, I'll tell you what, I didn't warm the bench all year so I could watch us go down on my account. Put the PD in, he's better. You want him to take your spot, you go give it to him. So when I, when I hear that story in John 21 that Emil read us, I really, because, you know, in contemporary Christianity, we like to focus on love a lot. So I focus on the questions. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. And I focus so much on the love questions that I miss the fact that there's some commands that Jesus gives in there. He says, feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. And I believe what Jesus is essentially saying to Peter in this moment is exactly probably what Alan whispered to Petey. It was get back in the game. And you see, this command, it's extremely significant. He's not just saying get back in the game. Because if you remember, in John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. I call them by name. I, Jesus, am the one who feeds the lambs and takes care of the sheep. But when I, Jesus, tell you, Peter, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, I'm not just saying, I want you back in the game, Peter. I'm saying, Peter, I want you back in the game, and I want you to take my place. I want you to play my role. I want you to be the shepherd. I want you to take my place on the field because I took your place on the cross. And that's what Jesus says to us. And you know, this must mean that Peter's totally transformed, right? Totally. Because, you know, if you've been at camp this week, you know that Simon means reed and Peter means rock. And so when Peter was first called, he was definitely the reed. He was flimsy, he swayed in the wind, back and forth, didn't know what he was about. And as we go throughout the Gospels, we see that he has moments of rock, but he's really still just a reed. And even in this moment, Peter's still not the rock, because you've got to follow me here to get this, and this is very significant. You see, in Greek, here we go, there are many different words for love, and there's two used in this story. There's agape, everybody say agape. agape. And agape is selfless, sacrificial, unconditional love. And then there's philia, everybody say philia. philia. And philia is affectionate regard, or friendship kind of love. And when Jesus asked the question, do you love me? Jesus asked Peter, do you agape me? Do you have undying love for me? And Peter's response is, I philia you. I have warm regard for you. And the second time Jesus asked, he asked, do you agape me? And Peter says again, I, I philia you. And then the third time, Jesus comes down to Peter's level. And he says, do you philia me? And Peter says, yes, uh, I philia you. I, I realize my love 
is not unconditional for you. Obviously, it's not. You saw, you knew I was going to betray you. You know that my love's not perfect yet. I'm just not there yet, Jesus. What do you want from me? But you see, even though Peter's not the rock yet, the command never changes. He still says, I want you to be the shepherd. Even though you're not changed yet, I still want to use you. And that's what God says to us. He says, even though you're not there yet, even though you're not perfect yet, even though your love for me is still a little flawed, I still want to use you, so get back in the game. Because Jesus is the ultimate recognizer of our potential. Why? Because he's the one who put it there. Jeremiah 1.5 Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Jesus says, Simon, I know you're still a reed at times, but I know there's a rock inside of you somewhere. And Jesus is saying to you tonight, I know you're a reed sometimes, but there is a rock inside of you somewhere. And tonight... It's time for you to get back in the game. And when you get back in the game, it might just be just like it happened to Petey. You see, what made Petey stumble in the past was not being able to hold on to the ball. And that was his greatest misery. But after he's called and after he's put back in the game, his greatest misery becomes his greatest ministry for his team. And your greatest misery that you've been dealing with for I don't know how long is about to become your greatest ministry tonight when you get back in the game with God. I'm telling you. And so, three steps to transformation in your life that I have just dropped. Answer the call. Learn to love the rooster and get back in the game. And what we slowly realize is that the fourth step is probably rinse and repeat. You see, transformation doesn't come by following Jesus and giving up as soon as you screw up. Transformation comes by answering the call and getting back in the game no matter how many times the rooster has crowed in your life. Transformation comes by saying these words, I may not be where I want to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. I'm okay, and I'm on my way. I'm back in the game.